For almost 60 years of progress and achievement, Grossmont College continues to change lives through education while serving the needs of East County, San Diego. With almost 100 associate degree options to choose from, Grossmont College provides an atmosphere that is big enough to serve, yet small enough to care about your educational goals. We view our past with pride, our present with confidence, and our future with anticipation. Grossmont College, a great place to start and change your life through education. I'm Melissa Cole. I'm Sharice Kelly. I'm Stephen Keener. Welcome to this special edition of the Dirt Report. During a time when the news is essential, now more than ever, the Media Communications Department at Grossmont College has become vital in teaching the broadcasting of accurate information and balanced reporting. The spring 2020 semester introduced the innovative television, video producing, and directing course to the curriculum for the first time in seven years. Only redesigned as a news broadcasting class, weaving documentary style journalism into field reporting. This course was originally intended to pair Grossmont College's professional grade television studio with field journalism throughout our community. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the closure of local schools, and the following lockdown, the course changed suddenly, but our news teams stepped up, every member becoming a reporter in addition to their normal duties to follow the pandemic and its effects on our community. Persistent in time of the pandemic, the class was able to persevere, transforming in-person interviews into Zoom conference calls, obeying social distancing and stay-at-home orders, while still creating productions. The entire class was involved and contributed to the making of this Griffin Report production, which examines how students and staff at the colleges, along with members of our community, have been personally affected by the global coronavirus pandemic. Here is media communication student Gian Ramirez with the story. The global spread of the relentless COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 can easily resemble that of a dream, or more realistically, a nightmare the entire world is waiting to wake from. It's like I haven't even like really like thought about that this could like ever happen and now that it's happening it feels like I'm in a dream like it's so crazy like I feel like just like my life like totally changed. I had seen the ring on the wall for about two weeks and a lot of people were like we're just gonna wait till we're told something because everything I was seeing coming west as it was heading from China and up you know all the way through New York into the like it was just coming and it was you know so Sure. The writing was on the wall. On January 19th, China reported its first death linked to the novel coronavirus. As of May 9th, the number of COVID-19 cases surpassed 4 million globally, with the U.S. contributing with 1.2 million cases leading the world. Amidst this global devastation, the virus has sent shockwaves, closures, and quarantines throughout the United States, catapulting California into a new normal. One of the most impactful shifts was the sudden closure of school campuses nationally. I remember walking across the quad and seeing the president. She mentioned that they were discussing statewide about shutting down the colleges and having everybody off campus. And I thought, oh, well, we'll see how that goes. And two days later, ta-da. The California Community College school system was not immune to complying with the dynamic regulations. Both uh, Grossmont and Cuyamaca colleges campuses are closed to all but a few essential employees. In a district-wide joint email sent March 15 from Grossmont President Nabil Abu Ghazale, Cuyamaca President Juliana Barnes and Chancellor Lynn Saracino Nolt wrote, Effective Monday, March 16, we are closing the Grossmont and Cuyamaca College campuses to all students and the public until further notice. All instructional activities, including any lab courses and support services, will be held in some form of remote delivery to the extent feasible. We haven't made a final decision yet because it's still unclear what the situation is going to be. Uh, I'd say at this point, we are tentatively considering that classes will continue to be online, but we are monitoring uh, all everything that's coming out from, from the government. And if that situation changes, 
uh, we may shift. It's it's just too early to know for sure right now. I think the first thing would be to to understand that um, you know we we're following the the governor's orders to to stay closed. So um, we don't know exactly when we'll be able to reopen. Hopefully, it'll be soon. Um, but everything other than that is going as planned. Obviously, it's just all online. The spring semester was in full swing when the abrupt closures occurred as personnel were required to transition to a remote virtual education format. When we realized that we were going to have to shift uh, to an online environment, uh, the week before semester break, we suspended face-to-face -face classes for that week, and we used the eighth week of classes we suspend. And then the following week was uh, semester break. Faculty and students of the district attempt to adapt to the transition, as the campuses were not only centers for learning, but a community that individuals created and maintained relationships and connections through. So it's been a tough shift. It's been a lot. I mean, those first couple of weeks, those first three weeks were a scramble, a mad scramble, because it happened like that. For me, I love learning in campus. I'm a very social person and I like to see the people around me. I like to interact with people and I'm very visual as well. So I like to be present and listen to the people and interact with them. So for me, the best is in campus. Grossmont International student from Columbia, Lena Alvarez, offers perspective on not only the new educational format of her classes, but the social connectedness she misses through her daily interactions. I'm uh, so afraid about the online classes since for me it seems like online classes is like homework, homework, and homework, and projects, and homework. <laughs> and I don't feel like the same way being like in campus. I miss driving there, enjoying the view, it's a really nice view for me. And of course, enjoying of the equipment, saying hi to, for example, even to the chief engineer, that I always say hi, and seeing all the people playing around with all the equipment with my classmates, and enjoying like the scoring stuff. Yeah, like I say, I'm very social, so I love to be around people, which, this COVID-19 has ruined my social life. I was a little surprised with the speed that it happened. Uh, we, we were kind of expecting a bit more notice and, and it would have been nice to have uh, grabbed more stuff as I was leaving that I thought I'd need. And unfortunately, um, at the time we were, the feeling was it wouldn't be a very long closure. It's, it's not too bad, but it, it was really quick. And I said, hey, guess what? You're, you're not coming back tomorrow. And it was the afternoon the day before. Zoom has not only become a household name, but has played as a technological savior amongst institutions, companies, and society. The free cloud platform for video and audio conferencing counted 200 million daily meeting participants in March and in April. This figure had risen to 300 million. Cuyamaca College's EOPS program specialist Wyatt Bakyal explains the adjustment to the platform. Uh, it was a process at first, obviously. Um for pretty much everyone um, that works with, with within the district, um, and I imagine for the whole state. Um, but you know, we've we're probably a month in now, right? So um, we've we've adjusted pretty well. Um, just still getting what we can done uh, done from from home. And now that we're all well versed in Zoom and SARS online. Um, we're doing pretty well. George Dowden, Career Education Program Coordinator for Cuyamaca College, agrees with the district's success in the shift. You can look at it as a problem or as an opportunity. Uh, if you look at it as an opportunity, you can say, I can't do my regular job anymore. How can I accomplish it with the tools that I have or the situation that I have? And I think that allows you to think fresh and to come up with new ideas uh, to see how we can address student needs on an online basis. I took like in the past semesters two classes online. So I have been working on that on, on the Canvas a lot. And I think it's very useful since I can actually download it on my phone and I can just like turn on the notifications so I know what's going on even when I'm working or I'm just out and I know something is going on with the subject. So I think it's very helpful. And by Zoom, this is the first time I use it. So 
sometimes I have a little bit of problems with putting the audio or putting the video or I don't know where to see the people and I don't know what I'm doing. So it's kind of confusing, but I think it's very easy to. Full-time theater instructor at Grossmont, Brian Rickle, describes the mechanics of conducting theater classes through an online medium. Now we're having individual Zoom meetings where I look just like this, where you and I are talking, except you standing in a corner over there doing a monologue, and I'd say, eh, hey, stop, let's do it again, that kind of a thing. So that's been tough. Rickle empathizes with students as he also prepares to become chair of the theater department come fall. It's been a difficult transition, I think, for some of the students who want to be in a face-to-face -face class to be now be in an online class. I think that's just the normal difficulty for people. I don't like online classes. If I'm being totally honest, I'm not even a huge fan of teaching them. But, but I understand their place. I understand why people like them. I am a face-to-face -face person. I'm a big gregarious guy, and I, that's just how I work. I prefer like being in an actual physical class because then I feel like it's like forces you to set apart time and like I feel like in a class like everyone's also like trying to pay attention and no one's like in the other room like watching tv and stuff like it's so distracting I feel like none of my um you're just kind of like throwing it all at us like expecting us to learn it on our own and it's like really hard lab classes are difficult and in some instances impossible to adapt for instance media communication classes that require essential tools and on-campus buildings housing the unique labs i think it'll definitely adapt However, I think certain courses are definitely going to suffer. Um, right. Production classes that require hands-on practices, things along those lines. Students will require more of their resources financially um, in order to be able to succeed in those classes. In addition, instructors are going to have to be able to put themselves into the 21st century that they didn't think about um, 10, 15 years ago. What can they use here at home? GoPros, cell phones, DSLRs that are cheap to buy, things along those lines. But I think at the end of the day, it's really going to hit the students harder than anybody else. I think um, the biggest problems we have are the classes that really don't lend themselves to online learning at all. Uh, yeah. The, TV studio classes, for example. Very difficult to do the same thing when you can't do the hands-on portions. Unfortunately, due to the current unforeseen circumstances, several students dropped their enrolled classes in response to transitioning to a distance learning environment and the uncertainty that COVID-19 conjured. We've certainly lost students, which was to be expected, I think, in this, um, especially with what's going on in this everyday student life right now. It's just to be expected. We were going to lose some students. I've lost about, I would say, a little bit over a quarter of my acting classes just kind of disappeared. And, and that's, again, to be expected. I've reached out. People just have stuff going on. And I've lost about a third of my face-to-face -face narrative theory class once it went online. My online narrative theory class is like holding strong. Numbers are great because those are people who took an online class. But the shifts we've had to make to teach acting online hard um it's mostly it would be it would be anecdotal for me um i i do know that there are a number of students that have had to drop unfortunately um because of the the uh closure of the campuses um and that's from what i've been kind of observing mostly from um lack of technology on some of the students ends um so we're actively trying to get technology to the students and hopefully we'll have more information about that pretty soon here Student Support Services empathizes with the needs of individuals during this difficult and unprecedented transition. The challenges that we're facing right now um, is how do we get physical services to our students? Um, so like um, our, our department in particular, we have uh, meal vouchers that we, we give to our students that they can use at the cafeteria um, and, other, and we give them uh, book services, financial book services that they can utilize at the bookstore. Um, obviously, the campuses are closed, so the students don't have access to um, the physical bookstore and the cafeteria, et cetera. So we're trying to figure out right now as a department and as a division, a division in student services um, of how we can either adjust our services to be digital um, that are traditionally physical or um, possibly get our physical services out to our students. We'll be right back after this public service announcement. For over 40 years, Cuyamaca College has been noted as one of the best community college campuses in California. Located in Rancho San Diego between El Cajon and Hamul, 
Cuyamaca College has provided students opportunities in several career and academic fields. Cuyamaca focuses on student success, providing students a guided pathway toward career and transfer opportunities. Cuyamaca also partners with area businesses, helping to serve the demands for a well-trained workforce. So what are you waiting for? Log on to www.cuyamaca.edu and start your educational adventure today. Cuyamaca College, learning for the future. Some necessities go beyond the educational spectrum. Food pantries amongst college campuses had become an essential need for individuals with food insecurities. Grossmont College developed Gizmo's Kitchen, a grab-and-go pantry held on campus, providing students with not only food, but daily hygienic products. Resource specialist with student engagement at Grossmont and a graduate student intern at SDSU, Jezel Diaz, leads Gizmo's Kitchen. She worries how the pandemic is affecting the students that were receiving the pantry's services before the closure of the campus. So one of my first concerns that was outside of my control was not being able to serve our students that do self-identify as homeless. Um, they've been misplaced. She was able to create and distribute an ID card allowing Grossmont students to receive food. All of our donations have completely come to an end, at least from my end from what I am aware of. So I think that's also a great thing to add why we were very focused on creating these ID cards for our students. We've still been able to connect students to 211 services. So for those who were able to utilize our services every single week through our food pantry, What's really awesome about their ID card is that they have the ability to reach out to any food pantry outside of Grossmont College, so within their local service area. So imagine where you live, there's probably a food pantry closer to your place. And with two-in-one services, it's completely free. Sister Campus Cuyamaca is also developing ways to provide. We have our food pantries all over campus um, that students obviously were able to, to access. Um, <clears throat> so that's another you know concern that we have. Uh, we have some good ideas in the works, and, and once again, when we have more information, we'll be able to give it to students. Just a matter of like being able to communicate with our students, and then also being very aware that not every student has access to free Wi-Fi, or not every student has access to a free laptop. So our institution has done a really good job of trying to advocate for our students that don't have those types of necessities in order to succeed academically in a virtual learning environment. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm seeing, but when it comes to food, that's all physical. Even if it's like a hygiene kit bag with menstrual pads, um, shampoo, conditioner, and toothbrush, toothpaste. Something that I appreciate about Grossmont is their ability to engage the students. So whether that's through convocation, whether that's through the week of welcome, we've been very adamant as a faculty and staff, as an entire institution, to really create these opportunities for students to be aware of some of the resources that are available to them outside of an academic setting. So being able to to contribute to their sense of belonging, making sure that they're finding ways to get involved, whether that's through a student club, whether that's through associated students, whether that's being a teacher's assistant, whether that's doing work study in student services, like we wanna make sure that we're equipping our students to some of the resources that are available to them for free. So, um, that's something that I've been really proud of. Another segment of students that offer a unique set of circumstances during the pandemic are those that were classified as essential employees at their respective off-campus jobs. I've actually had one student drop um, because of his work schedule. He's considered a essential personnel, therefore he did have to drop the class. Michaela Wardrip is a Grossmont student majoring in media communications. She was also designated as an essential employee for her job at Target. Target, one of the few stores which remained open during the California stay-at-home order imposed on March 19th. Personally, for me, it's caused me a lot of anxiety just because I'm already a germaphobe and now I'm an essential worker. So that's also caused me a lot of anxiety. She describes unique encounters she has experienced while working with the general public throughout the pandemic. It kind of depends. Like some people are wearing masks, wearing gloves, and like you could tell they're being very cautious. Like they don't want to be like be near people or anything. But then there's some people like when I get asked a question, 
they'll be like right next to me and I'm like, oh, that's not six feet. <laughs> Along with Target, various but few other businesses and facilities were labeled as essential and still were able to provide their services. Uh, deputies there are now required to wear masks as are with the inmates. Um, so everything has changed there in terms of the reduction in population uh, and then the distancing um, that's been implemented. Um, less people coming in, more people being released, population going down. Uh, so there's more deputies there, but they're still doing the same job, still doing everything that, that they've been doing. For other essential county workers, their immune systems may not be the only part of their health in jeopardy, as their state of their mental wellness becomes a concern. The virus has affected me mentally. I have been having anxiety and panic attacks since the start of the Stay at Home initiative, and it has changed my way of thinking and how I do things on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really crazy. You get to see like how many people are just full of anxiety, like the people uh, that take it seriously versus the people that don't, and also like the people that panic and think about themselves more than others, so they panic by everything and leave the rest of us with nothing. Michaela gives insight into some of the more peculiar items she's seen flying off the shelves. I'd say definitely toilet paper, paper towels, uh, hand sanitizer is really, really hard to find. But also when it comes to like food, I've noticed milk has been like, it's kind of sometimes there and sometimes it's not. And like the non-dairy, uh, it's like never in stock anymore. She, along with others in this community, attempts to highlight the positive aspects that emerge from this type of unforeseen new normal. And I definitely think it's good to thank workers, especially because we're under a lot of stress and we're getting very overwhelmed in this time because, you know, we're all very scared. So I think it's good to thank workers that you come across. Remember to, you know, just stay as clean as you possibly can when you come in. Don't touch things if you don't plan on buying them and to remain six feet apart. The thing that I would advise is to broaden your horizon. If you were trying to get up in a certain field and that job is kind of at a minimum right now because of this pandemic, I would think about looking at all the places that are hiring and go get a job that can give you experience and let you earn money while everything shut down during the pandemic so that when jobs come back, and they will, you'll be ready to go. While stress for some students centered around struggles of employment, others were grappling with the uncertainty of participating in a graduation ceremony. And actually, today, I got an email saying that congratulations and you're going to go late this semester, but the ceremony is going to be virtual, which for me, of course, is not like the best way to have a ceremony for my graduation. But I know health right now is the priority. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to have a traditional commencement uh, ceremony. It's going to be a, a virtual ceremony, ceremony. And uh, the people at the college now are working on what that's going to be like. Uh, so uh, we're still going to find ways to recognize our graduates, but uh, we're not going to be able to have the the uh, event where everyone watches them in person. While the pandemic hopefully ceases and the numbers stabilize, in the meantime, educational institutions adapt to the necessary changes in order to successfully serve their students. Yeah, the summer semester uh, is going to be all online. Uh, it starts uh, June 22nd, and we'll be starting registration for that uh, in, a few, uh, in a few weeks. And it's going to be a one six-week session. I think it's, it's been a blessing in disguise because it's allowed people to think about what they can do outside the box, outside of your office where you have a routine and think about some different ways to approach your job. I think we're uh, very easily adapted to the online world now. For some thought, if classes were to start back on campus tomorrow, they would not hesitate to be present. Of course, I will be right away there. I think it will be the first one. <laughs> Other students offer an opposite perspective. To be very honest, <laughs> no. 2020 is a new way to think. It's a new, you know, everything changed. 
I don't believe in that uh, traditional way to teach. I think that doesn't it doesn't work much for me. In historic and uncertain times like these, it's important for people to persevere using positivity and compassion, realizing a light lies at the end of this quarantine tunnel. No, there is something very special about a group of people. The great thing about live theater is that it happens once. Even if you have 12 performances, each performance only happens once because that same thing is never going to be repeated because it was never those people in the room there's this shared experience that comes along with humans being in a room in proximity together that we don't get in a movie theater. Right? But that doesn't mean art has to stop. The theater has survived since before the Greeks. Back to the Egyptians, we were using theater to, you know, to pray and, 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 and have religious ceremonies. So the theater survived thousands. The theater will survive COVID-19, I guarantee it. And they say it's time to, uh, that we can come out of this at we're all going to come out of this together and, uh, you know, we've all been successful in doing this. I know it's been hard, but we just keep going um, a little bit longer. We can not prolong this longer than it has to be. Was essential to us before the pandemic that are not, not as essential now. And there are things that were not essential before the pandemic that are very much essential now. So that's continuously hand washing, cleaning, keeping our distances, from each other and doing everything that we can to be positive during this stressful time. I know this is a hard time and everyone is having a, like issues to adjust and adapt to the changes. But in some point, I think we need to be focused on the important things. Like right now, health, family, trying to stay calm. Uh, obviously we couldn't foresee this coming, but um, I can personally vouch that when, when, um, you know, when we saw it coming, we had many meanings of how, how can we make this transi transition as smooth as possible for our students, um, because they're obviously our number one priority. I'd say the one thing that hasn't changed from before and continuing now is that, um, you know, our faculty and staff just uh, support our students. We want to help our students. We want to help them reach their goals, and we will do anything we can to, to help our students. Reporting remotely for Grossmont College in El Cajon, California, this is Gian Ramirez with the Griffin Report. Stay safe, healthy, positive-minded, and together we will conquer COVID-19. I'm Melissa Cole. I'm Sharice Kohey. I'm Stephen Keener. Thank you for watching the Griffin Report. Report.